do justice in the fall. And now in, a few, in the next few weeks, I'd like to spend some time reflecting on loving kindness. So, you know, Micah 6, 8, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. Um, Lent, with its emphasis on spiritual disciplines, uh, is a chance to consider that, consider that final core practice of core value of walking humbly with God. And Ash Wednesday, which is the start of Lent, is February 13th, which is exactly one month from today. So if you've ever been in the position of you get to Ash Wednesday and you think, oh, I haven't even figured out what I want to do for Lent, uh, now this is your chance, right, this week, to say, what is the thing that I would like to take up or what is the thing that I would like to let go of or fast from during the 40 days of Lent? So you've been warned. I'll probably talk about it next week, too. But today I'd like to spend some time reflecting on Jesus and his relationship with God and how that can be a foundation for the love that we have for one another. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Gracious, blessing, loving God, remind us of your care for us. Bless us with your spirit of peace. Open us to your presence. Let your love guide Strengthen and renew us to be bearers of your kingdom in the world. We pray in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus. Amen. So if I'm honest, a lot of the time, I tend to think about Jesus as kind of an easygoing hippie type of guy. Right? You know, with the long hair, he's got Birkenstock sandals, sort of wandering the countryside perhaps following a band, no, not really, but relying on the kindness of strangers. Um, a cool dude with maybe a dash of Che Guevara t-shirt thrown in, fight the powers kind of an attitude. Um, I think this particular Jesus is the one currently enjoying high approval ratings with the general public. Um, I've been calling him Che Guevara Jesus in my sermon prep. But that Jesus, uh, homeboy Jesus, Che Guevara Jesus, doesn't jive with the image of the Messiah that John preaches in today's scripture reading from Luke. For John, whose main preaching theme is, repent, the end is near, the Messiah to come, also known as the Christ, also known as the Anointed One, as in anointed to be the crowned king of Israel, this Messiah is near at hand, and he is powerful, magnificent, baptizing people with the Holy Spirit and fire, and is ready to separate the wheat from the chaff. So this is a description of someone very different from cool dude Jesus. For example, we may hear his winnowing fork in his, is in his hand and think, oh, that sounds like a nice agricultural ritual that people do with wheat. It involves maybe stomping or sifting or something. Probably not too difficult, right? Um, who has, ever, has anyone ever winnowed anything? I never have either, so I'm just... Uh, basically, winnowing grain is hard work. I'll just put it that way. You put the wheat into a pile and then you beat it with sticks so that the protective cover of the grain comes off. Like I've had brown rice and sometimes you get one that has like that little thing on it. It's like, that's tough to get off. And that's just one little grain of um, brown rice, right? Or sometimes wheat too. Has anyone ever get like one little... Ryan has... Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, no. (laughs) Wow. Wow. They were laughing with you. Well, is it? Uh, it's hard work. Am I right? Yes. And you're like, you should really hit it. Exactly. Um, it's called right. So hitting is the threshing, or also the word thrashing is the same. It means the same thing. You could say you're thrashing the grain. Although I don't. Nobody knows does that. But anyway, then after the threshing, you throw the whole pile into the air. So this is the winnowing. Is you have to throw the pile of grain into the air over and over again so that the chaff blows out so the wind blows out the holes come out in the wind and then just the wheat seeds are left Um, it takes persistence and strength and maybe a little bit of aggression anger so is John right about Jesus is Jesus the type of Messiah who comes along and puts everything into a pile and then beats out the bad from the good is Jesus the type to draw sharp lines And make things black and white. Did Jesus signal the beginning of the end of the world? Or is Jesus more of a cool dude asking everybody just go along and get along? To be honest, I don't think the Messiah who comes 
is the one that John is expecting. Even if, in some ways, what John predicts does come true. At the same time, Che Guevara Jesus is off the mark, too. Jesus is powerful and amazing. He does baptize people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he does separate the wheat from the chaff, which is something that requires not just cool hipness, but passion and dedication and strength. He heals people. He changes lives. He challenges corruption. He announces a new world breaking into our own. All this fits with John's words, but not perhaps in the way that he imagines. John makes room for judgment, but he doesn't make room for love in his doomsday preaching about the promised Messiah to come. What if for today we imagine Jesus not as a laid-back dude and not as the avenger at the end of the world, but as a loving teacher, someone who sees us for who we are, loves us, and dares us to do better? What if we see Jesus as a clever and unpredictable rabbi, bringing us up short against our limitations, putting us face to face with the shells and the husks that keep us hemmed in and separated from each other and a deeper and richer life? What if we see Jesus with his penetrating questions, his razor wit, his confounding stories, separating us from our pretensions and our masks, our sins and our defense mechanisms, all that chaff, and gathering us up, stripped to our essentials, bringing us into a new world, face to face with God. Many of us have been through experiences in our lives where we felt like we were on the threshing floor, getting beaten with sticks. And I'm not saying that grief or sickness or disappointment are the kinds of things that we would seek out or that somehow God plans or wants for us, but... At the end, after everything, by God's grace, we've often found that we lost something that we didn't need. That now we're more exposed to the world, but more open to it. Maybe freer, stronger to be who we are, or to trust God in whatever comes our way. This isn't the only way God can grow our spiritual life, but it is one way that God does it. And another way, or maybe a combination move, is that Jesus and his words and his Holy Spirit are available to us even now to free us from those husks, all that chaff, that keep us separate from one another. And what makes this good news, what makes this worth repeating, trying out, and pursuing, and listening, and following, what makes this grace is love. When the dove flies down from the broken sky... The voice of God doesn't recommend Jesus for his efficiency as an aid to self-improvement. The voice doesn't say, this is my highly effective son, with him I am greatly impressed. Jesus doesn't even get props for coolness, as in, this is my extremely chill son, with him I delight to hang out, although I do believe that is a true statement. No, God's word to Jesus at this spark, at this beginning, this call into his ministry is... This is my beloved son. And before Jesus has even done a lick of work, God continues, With him I am well pleased. God's love comes first for Jesus. And the thing is, God's word to us in this scripture, God's word to us through Jesus, whether we're buried in tough woody husks or free and open in the breeze, is you too are beloved. Let's live trusting that love in the teacher, the healer, the rabbi who passed it along to us. Thanks be to God. Amen.